I'll do it. Mr. Chair, I think we've, we've switched up. I'll, I'll take the lead on, okay, on this. Brown, Ross Brown with the LAO. Um, page eight of your agenda uh, includes a summary of the various issues related to Aliso Canyon natural gas leak uh, that occurred uh, towards the end of last year and, and spanning towards the beginning of this year as well, as well as various natural gas management issues. Uh, the governor requested a total of 36 positions and 13 million from various special funds for f oversight activities at five state agencies. The assembly approved the governor's proposal with one minor exception, converting uh, three permanent positions at PUC to three year limited term positions, which was uh, consistent with the recommendation that we made. Uh, the Senate uh, approved the governor's budget proposals subject to the patches passage of statute to provide accountability and reporting to the legislature. The Senate also added $2.1 billion and seven permanent, uh, excuse me, $2.1 million and seven uh, permanent positions at PUC to implement SB 380, which passed uh, just recently, which among other things requires PUC to open a proceeding to assess the ongoing need for Aliso Canyon for energy reliability in the region. Uh, the Senate also adopted a variety of different pieces of trailer bill language uh, in general related to reporting, oversight, monitoring, and collecting information on uh, natural gas regulation. I'll try to walk through them very quickly. Uh, trailer bill language, first uh, at the bottom of page 8, trailer bill language to establish a single point of contact to be responsible for natural gas safety. Uh, provide mechanisms for agencies to work together and provide for annual reporting on the administration's effort to improve natural gas safety within the state. Page nine of your agenda, uh, language directing the Energy Commission to establish a natural gas tracking and rating system. Uh, also language requiring Dogger to develop uh, best practices for design, maintenance, uh, reporting, plugging, and abandonment of gas storage wells. And finally, providing for a contract for the California uh, Center for Science and Te Technology to study natural gas transmission and storage within the state and provide recommendations regarding such things as uh, gaps in regulation and where the state should focus increase, focus increase enforcement efforts. Uh, just a couple of uh, minor recommendations and comments from our office. Uh, again, as I mentioned before, we recommend the assembly version of converting the three permanent positions at PUC to limited term, given uh, the uncertainty about ongoing workload. Uh, also, with respect to the $2.1 million adopted by the Senate to implement SB 380 uh, in an effort to sort of uh, bridge the two houses, we are recommending uh, approving $1.7 million for one year. Uh, at this point, we don't have a detailed fiscal estimate from the Public Utility Commission associated with implementing this bill, and $1.7 million was the available fiscal estimate at the time the bill was passed, and by, by taking this action, it would provide some resources in the near term to implement, and the PUC could come back with a request for long-term resources after uh, next year. Thank you. Ms. Costa? Thank you. The administration supports the Assembly's version of this package. I would note um, that we also, outside of the Assembly package, do support the Senate proposal regarding funding for implementation of SB 380. We believe that the amount of $2.1 million provided by the Senate is the appropriate amount. Um, again, this was uh, one of the issues where it was timing. This bill was passed in May while we were completing and releasing the May revise. But because the bill has been enacted, we believe these resources are appropriate to implement the statute. Um, I would note that we do have, uh, the administration has concerns with some of the proposed Senate trailer bill language, and if you have questions about those, I'm happy to answer. Thank you. Questions from the committee? Senator Lano. So, Ms. Costa, just to clarify, uh, you would have a compromise of sorts slightly different from the LAOs in that uh, in agreement with the assembly action, but then also with the funding on the Senate side. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? Okay, seeing none, uh, we'll move to issue three, pest prevention. Mr. Martin. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sean Martin, Legislative Analyst Office. The Senate um, budget includes $15 million general fund and budget bill language. And of that amount, $5 million may be used for Pierce's disease management, $5 million for overall pest and health, uh, uh, 
health and pest prevention, and five million for Asian citrus psyllid controls as follows. 4.25 million for the residential application by the California Department of Food and Agriculture in quarantine areas, and 750,000 for an interagency agreement with the Department of Pesticide Regulation to provide a consumer product database for the residential level study of the impacts of ornamental uses of neonicotinoids, which are uh, a component of pesticides that are uh, potentially uh, causing the death of pollinators such as honeybees. Sorry, Ms. Scott. Ms. Costa. Thank you. Uh, the administration supports the assembly's version of this item. We'd note that the governor's budget already includes $1 million in food and agricultural funds in 1617 and 1718 for increased applications in quarantine areas to help combat the Asian citrus ciliad pest. Um, and so we don't believe this augmentation is necessary. Thank you. Any comments or Mr. Urbanolte? I had a question for the Department of Finance. So uh, AB 2714 is pending the legislature cleared appropriations last week, which would also appropriate $5 million for Pierce's disease. So if we also put that in the budget, does that mean that we have $10 million total appropriated for Pierce's disease? Brennan Murphy, Department of Finance. Ye yes, it would. All right. So we should. what's the recommendation? We should do one or the other? I believe our recommendation was um, neither. Neither. Okay, yes. Okay, got it. Thank you. Senator Olson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I actually think the Senate version of this part of the conference plan is very important. Uh, ACP, Asian Citrus Psyllid, is spreading rapidly across the state. We already have 21 counties under quarantine. Uh, the most recent counties are the two counties I represent, Stanislaus and San Joaquin counties. So I'm very concerned that our citrus industry, which is a $4.5 billion industry in this state, um, is going to be herded, herded. That's a lovely new word. Uh, hurt dramatically if we don't allocate this funding. So I think that the Pierce's disease funding and the five million for the overall health of the program is really important. On the ACP, I'm so concerned about it that I would suggest the committee consider removing the seven hundred and fifty thousand from that piece and moving it into the five million for overall CDFA programs. I think it makes more sense there anyway, and I'd be curious if the LAO has an opinion on that or the Department of Finance. Uh, no, we don't. We don't have an opinion on moving the seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars to another area. However, we would note that the Senate recently held a, a hearing on the um, citrus psyllid, and it devast devastated the uh, citrus crops in Florida. It's a very serious threat to our citrus industry in California, and a number of uh, people from the industry have spoken to the effect of, of their concern that something similar to what happened in Florida could happen in California. Thank you. Ms. Costa. We don't have a position. Okay, thank you. Senator Nielsen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I've offered some language uh, to the committee, uh, Mr. Chairman, and it goes a little bit uh, along the lines of what uh, Senator uh, Assemblyman Woman Olson has said. This would ex uh, talk about the $5 million, but allocate 750000 <clears throat> to be used for an interagency agreement <clears throat> with <clears throat> Department of Pesticide Regulation, <clears throat> excuse me, to provide a consumer product, product database. Now, this is getting into the urban areas, if you will, for a residential level study of the impact on ornamental uses of neonicotinoids, including the impact of neonicotinoidal treatment of seed plants sold at the retail level. And then for the Huang Blong Bing eradication activities in urban areas, and this is what's key and important, and consumer education and outreach. In the urban areas, consumer outreach and education is critically important for those consumers in the urban areas to know what's going on. And this would be directing a, a small amount of that for that purpose. Great. Thank you, Senator. Senator Leno. Let me add my voice to the chorus of concern. 
specifically with uh, Asian citrus psyllid. And wanted to hear from Ms. Costa as to the administration's recognition of the seriousness of the threat, what we might have learned from the state of Florida, and the funds that you already have in your proposal, and why you think there is absolutely no need for any augmentation. Thank you. Um, I think that, you know, by including investment in this area, we are recognizing the seriousness of the program. I think the distinction here is the level of funding that we think is, is required, and we just don't believe at this juncture the augmentation is necessary. Um, and I'll defer to my colleague, Mr. Murphy, but my understanding is also that uh, some of these programs are paid through industry self-assessments, um, and we believe that that is uh, also sufficient. Thank you. I, I would just add that the, the citrus pest and disease prevention program as a whole has $16.6 million in, from the Food and Agriculture Fund, as well as uh, $9 million from Federal Trust Fund. So, uh, you know, I, I, the belief here is that there, there's a robust program uh, in addition to the million dollars that we've already uh, added in. And to the extent that, that, that it really does become, you know, a crisis, as in, as in a disaster, we've responded to disasters in, in this field before many times. And, you know, the, the real key here is the increased monitoring and, and moving forward at this point out of the program budget. <clears throat> Excuse me. Can you, my you voice. No, so, okay, Mr. Murphy, can you share with us a little bit is how are those millions of dollars spent with sort of programs specific yeah. to citrusillid? So I think the... Um, In all honesty, I think I'm going to have to get back to you. Okay. <laughs> I apologize, but I'd be happy to get back to you with that information. Sure. So, uh, what? Yes, please. I think I gave a little bit. Um, thank you. Um, so that we work with county agricultural commissioners uh, with their expenses for abandoned citrus orchards. Um, we have a diagnostics laboratory that uh, we use the money for. We do public outreach and. Um, there's, uh, those are the, the items that I know about. If uh, we just had a debate on our Senate floor with regard to the issue of uh, citrusillid and also the use of neonics, there was the issue raised of quarantines in residential areas. So if I have a property and I've got some citrus trees in my backyard and I'm within a quarantined area, does the state come to assist in dealing with those trees in my backyard, which are within a quarantine area? How does that work? I believe the state does come to assist. It may be occur through the county agricultural commissioner. I understand that there's a lot of collaboration at the at the local level. Uh, one so of this the is through CDFA. Yes. Um, one of the major concerns that the the growers have is that a lot of people have these trees in their backyards and they can be a vector point for this Asian citrus psyllid and so getting the cooperation from the public to allow people to go in and check the trees and make sure they're okay and then treat them if there is a problem. And if I'm not in a quarantined area and I have citrus trees in my backyard, what might I do if I'm concerned or Maybe I recognize there might be some trouble. Uh, CDFA does not come to my rescue then. Or I'm told uh, there might be a notice on my door that there might be a problem with my trees. I, I think that would be handled by the, the, the um, you know, I'd have to check on that. Okay. That's exactly how that would work. All right. Uh, the other side, of, the other part of this conversation uh, with regard to citrusillid and neonicotinoids is that there is significant science now that these neonics are one of the aggregating factors to the precipitous fall in the health of our bee colonies. And in fact, uh, Ortho and Scott's major players in the ornamental market have pulled all of their neonicotinoid products off shelves of nurseries. So any plants or seeds that have been treated with neonics, they are now not selling at the re retail level. And so I wondered, what is the administration doing with the 
20, 30 percent decline in our bee populations in the state because that's also a serious threat to our agricultural industry. I believe, although I could be corrected, there's an item later in the agenda dealing with pollinators. Um, and uh, if you'll give me a moment, I can look and see. I, I believe that there is an additional augmentation that we, we don't support on that particular program. Right. That wasn't my question, though. The question is, what is the administration doing? And what is your level of concern? What is your level of recognition that there is a serious threat, so serious that the likes of Ortho and Scotts have changed their whole business plan because of their concern for neonics and its impact on bees? Ellen Roddy, Department of Finance. Um, I think it's, it is a serious concern of the part of the administration and the governor's budget, the Jan 10 version, does uh, have a request, which both houses approved for additional resources for the pollinar, pollinator protection program. And then, um, as uh, Ms. Costa direct, um, indicated, there's an issue later in the agenda where one of the houses augmented that program to expedite the work. Right, that I'm familiar with, and we'll wait to hear why you oppose that in a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you. I just had a question for Mr. Murphy. Could you restate the um, figures of funding that are already occurring in this area? You mentioned I was, wasn't able to write them down fast enough. All right. So I uh, apologize. I actually have even more updated numbers. So it's uh, $15.6 million from the Food and Agriculture Fund and $10.5 million uh, from the Federal Trust Fund. <clears throat> Excuse me. I apologize. I really am losing my voice today. Thank you. And sorry, John Fitzpatrick, Department of Finance as well. would just like to note that that 10.5 federal funds in current year reflects about a $1.6 million increase over past year. So that combined with the administration's BCP um, for this area does represent a pretty sizable increase in funding uh, directed uh, to this program and its challenges. Great. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, seeing none, uh, we'll move on to issue four, human right to water. Mr. Martin, are you leading off? Thank you. I am, thank you. Um, so there are three issues before you. The first is $10 million general fund and one five-year limited term position for uh, water bottle filling installations with point of use filtration uh, when necessary to provide safe drinking water to students that do not have access to it currently. It would be about 930 bottled water filling stations serving approximately 400,000 students. And we understand that the intent is that there would be some flexibility here similar to what's provided in AB 2124 by uh, Garcia and uh, Mr. Lack and Lackey. Uh, the second item is the Assembly's proposal to increase funding for the Department of Water Resources to address drinking water shortages, primarily from dry residential wells in small communities, uh, from $10 million general fund, which was proposed by the governor and approved by the Senate, to $15 million. And then the last proposal is for $565,000 from the safe drinking water account that would fund four permanent positions uh, in the Division of Drinking Water within the State Water Resources Control Board to expedite data collection and resolve discrepancies between the Safe Drinking Water Information System state databases and the federal databases and improve monitoring and um, noncompliance determinations for water districts and local agencies. Thank you. Ms. Costa. Thank you. We support uh, the Senate's version, which is consistent with the administration's proposal on this matter. Thank you. Any questions or comments from the committee? Senator Mayor Olson. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I've noticed the items in conference, one of the items in conference has to do with two additional positions for data collection and management to track access to safety of drinking water, and I think that's a positive proposal. Um, but I wanted to use that to speak to other parts that aren't necessarily in conference, but that had questions on in the budget in general. So these are two positions related to 
it appears maybe nearly 100 new positions that are being added to the State Water Resources Control Board and the Department of Water Resources for a variety of different purposes. Um, I wanted to ask about two in particular. It says that we're adding seven new positions in order to deal with the backlogs within the State Water Resources Control Board related to water right decisions, licensing, et cetera. And so is the expectation that if we add another seven positions that we'll start to address the 40-year backlog? And I would assume that would be more appropriate for Department of Finance to answer. Ellen Moradi, uh, Department of Finance. That proposal was um, seven positions funded with the Water Rights Fund. Um, the, I mean, the, the reason it's proposed is that the intent is to address the backlog. Will it resolve the backlog? No, but it should make um, some pretty significant progress. And is that being tracked by the Water Board, and do they have to report their progress to Department of Finance? Because it doesn't seem like we've been making much progress over the last four decades. Uh, that's not, I mean, we collect data when the d department makes a request for an augmentation. Um, is there an annual reporting requirement? No, there is not. Um, the Water Board um, does a very good job of posting uh, the dashboard on their website for a variety of programs. Okay. And then my second question is, if I'm reading through the budget correctly, it looks like we're allocating 12 positions for the implementation of Prop 1, the water bond, uh, but 35 new positions to manage the cultivation of marijuana and water diversions if they're associated with marijuana. So does the Department of Finance think that that ratio makes sense, or can you explain how those numbers were determined? Again, there is uh, several items dealing with the package the administration has proposed to create the regulatory framework for medical marijuana. I would note, and I will note when we get to that item, that given the fast timeline for implementation for the regulatory process, we believe the package presented is we would, I think, undercut our ability to actually create the regulatory framework within the statutory guidelines without those positions and resources. Okay, but the, the department or the administration feels that 12 positions is adequate to implement Prop 1, the water bond, in an expeditious manner? We do. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Senator Lara. For the LAO, do we know approximately how many children uh, don't have access to clean or safe drinking water, either in their homes or in their schools? I, I mean, I, can't, I honestly can't believe this is still an issue here in California, but... Do we have a, an, an approximate number? Well, I don't have an, a, a precise number that, that I'm aware of, but I could try and look and see if there is an estimate out there and get back to you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Senator Leno. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. A related question to Senator Lara's. Um, correct me if my numbers are off a little. I've seen the figure that about 3% of Californians, maybe over a million people, are unable to drink their tap water in our state. Is that anywhere near accurate? I don't have a specific percentage. Um, it sounds within within the realm of, of numbers that I've heard recently, though. Uh, we've all read the stories of the sufferings of the folks in East uh, Porterville and other places in the state. Would it be appropriate for, and this is a question for Ms. Costa as well, for the state to focus on this, I think we sh need to know more accurately. And if the administration has a guess as to how many people in California cannot drink their tap water, and I think we can include in that definition, also can't bathe in their tap water, can't wash their clothes in their tap water. How many people are we talking about? Do we think it's worthy to have a goal to reduce that number to zero? And what funding will it take us to get there and what time frame will it take us to get there we don't have that data senator leno um, as you can see some of our proposals do address emergency water supplies for disadvantaged communities for that very purpose but to the question your first question about data we don't have that data yes rachel ehlers lao um i think within this package there are sort of two different categories of 
of water-related issues. One has really come to light because of the drought and a lot of residential wells and areas going dry because of the drought, which has created a lot of attention around the issue, particularly in East Porterville and some other communities primarily in the Central Valley, but not exclusively in the Central Valley. Um, information from the Department of Water Resources and their tracking system are that there are 3,200 um, residential water outages that are explicitly drought related that have been identified, which they think is pretty um, undercounting because that's just who has come forward. Of those, about a thousand have been addressed so far and largely addressed with emergency tanks and water bottles, but they're working on permanent solutions, which is what the 10 million that was proposed by the governor and an additional 5 million added by the assembly are trying to work so towards some more permanent um, solutions for some of those drought affected communities. But I think it also has really raised, as has Flint, Michigan, raised the issue of what about other water conditions around the state for humans um, and residences and schools that are not explicitly because of drought but are because of water quality issues and, and water quality issues that have been exacerbated by the drought as wells have gone deeper. So I think that's the larger universe that people are starting to pay m more attention to because, in part because of the drought, but that we just really don't have our hands around yet at this point. Yes, Mr. Martin. Uh, yes, yeah, Senator Leonard. With regards to your earlier question, I don't have a precise answer, but from 2005 to 2011, roughly 15 percent of schools in California had at least one violation of their water quality, according to the State Water Resources Control Board. Okay. And can we identify numbers to how much we included in the recent water bond? for the infrastructural needs of the communities that you've just referenced and who are currently being assisted by the state through emergency delivery of bottled or tanked water, but the problem is infrastructure, and that's what we need to get at so that they can finally drink their tap water. Yeah, so in as part of the drought packages the legislature has approved in recent years, um, uh, up until this year there's been $310 million provided for emergency drinking water, of which $244 million was from Prop 1, was for some of these longer-term, more permanent solutions, um, and then $66 million was uh, was emergency, categorized as emergency. Um, in 1617, the budget that's that's before you, there's an additional 49 million that was included in the governor's proposal, really focusing on that emergency. So, so I suppose in answer to your question, the legislature already has appropriated 244 million from Prop One for some of these longer-term, more permanent. Thank you. So I'll just conclude by saying uh, the uh, protestations of a presidential candidate touring our state this week reminding us that we don't have a drought notwithstanding. I think we do need to con continue to recognize that the drought has exacerbated an already bad situation in so many parts of our state, and that uh, to the degree that you can assist us in more quickly getting those bond dollars out the door so that we can get projects moving, which will put people to work, but will also finally address the infrastructural needs that probably a million or more people in California, depending upon. Thank you. Question for Ms. Costa. Um, there's an estimated 1,000 schools that are impacted by the lack of safe drinking water. Uh, we had a proposal for $10 million for water bottle filling stations. Um, given your lack of support for that, what, what what's an alternative for those schools and their drinking water situation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would note, as we discussed yesterday during the education portion of the agenda, that the administration believes local school districts have plenty of discretionary funding um, that could be directed towards this purpose. So, so your, your thought is that uh, school districts should use LCFF money or um, district money for, for that purpose? Our position is that the local control funding formula, the structure of that funding mechanism is to allow local districts to deal with the unique circumstances and student characteristics of the, their district. Thank you. Okay. Seeing, seeing no other questions or comments, we'll move on to issue five, professional standards. 
Miss Ames from LEO. 